Okay, good morning. Uh, let's get started. Any uh, questions from last time? Any questions? So the main message from uh, last lecture is that if you have a point charge, its electric field is found by uh, the formula we derived and fundamentally it is force per unit charge. So we know what is the force between two charges and that force we can interpret as um, the charge that experiences the force times the electric field that is created by the other charge that exerts that force. And um, if you want to plot this electric field, if you have a point uh, a charge that is positive, as is shown here in the applet, the electric field points away from the charge. As you see here, the lines are actually moving, the, uh, vector, the arrows are moving away from the positive charge. So the positive charge is actually a source of electric um, uh, field vector. And um, something that you can not see directly is that actually the magnitude of that electric field decays as 1 over distance squared. This is also something you can see from this applet. You will be working uh, in this, uh, with these applets in your uh, labs. So if you actually do here display electric field, you can see that if you are at a distance of one unit, one nanometer from the charge, the electric field I see here is 3.308. Uh, the units are volts per meter. We'll explain those units uh, later on. For now, I am giving the units of Newton per Coulomb. So if I double the distance, you, you see that actually the uh, field decays uh, with a factor of about four. So indeed, uh, the uh, relation between electric field magnitude and distance is one over distance squared. However, uh, this uh, idea of the, uh, this field of a single charge is not very interesting. Usually we don't get just one charge and we calculate the fields. We have systems like the power lines that are charged along an entire area and we are interested in finding what fields they would create. For these cases, the principle that holds, and it's a very convenient principle, is that of superposition. That is, if I keep adding charges here, the electric field, the total electric field of this system of charges will be equal to the uh, sum of the fields that each one of those charges has created. And uh, one more thing I wanted to show you is that this principle is very simple, uh, but many times we forget it, although it is actually very useful and will be useful throughout the course, that positive charges are sources, uh, negative charges sinks of electric fields. So now if I make a more complicated system, which has two positive charges and one negative charge here, you see still that this principal holes and you have the presence of the negative charge creating a deformation of the electric field so that now you have uh, arrows sinking onto the negative charge. So this is, this is the qualitative picture and I want to go a little bit more quantitative now so that you uh, understand a bit more uh, how these uh, formulas work. Make sure we have as much light as possible. So let me uh, remind you the general formula. Uh, if I have a charge at a point, and again this formula is talking about point charges, that's why I can assign coordinates to those charges. So if I have a point charge Q at, that is defined, its position is defined by a position vector R prime, and I'm interested in the field that this creates at the observation point P, uh, then that field will be given by this formula here. And superposition applies. So here is an example where we will see both this formula and superposition all at once. So the example is uh, find the electric field
at an observation point with coordinates um, 2, 3, 4, uh, created by an electron at 1, 1, 2. And uh, another charge, Q2, it has the charge of two protons and it is at 3, 5, 6. Okay, so we will see the uh, two examples of how you apply this formula and then we'll add them up uh, to find the total field. So you see the, uh, for uh, the first charge, for Q1, or first of all, let me just talk about the observation point that is uh, common. So position vector for observation point two, three, four. That is uh, x hat or 2x hat plus 3y hat plus 4z hat. Uh, in some books, I don't know uh, if you are uh, using an alternative textbook, you may see this x hat, y hat, z hat unit vectors as ax. Uh, uh, B, uh, a, a, X, A, Y, A, Z. So you may have, uh, you may see alternative notations, but uh, what we really mean here is this is the X unit vector, Y unit vector, Z unit vector. So now I go to the first charge, Q1, and I find its electric field. To find the electric field, I need to find uh, its position vector. First. Uh, so the position vector of Q1, you see the coordinates is 1, 1, 2, so it's x plus y plus 2z. Okay. And now we'll find the distance between the two. And just to uh, visualize what we are doing here, let me just uh, draw... this coordinate system and what uh, we're uh, try to put approximately uh, those points. So you see P is at uh, 2, 3, so let's say this is 2, 3, and then uh, 4. So the observation point is somewhere here. Okay, and then we have a, an electron basically at 1, 1, 2. So it is at 1, 1, 2. So we have an electron there. And uh, I expect that this electron will generate an electric field. Remember the main rule here. The electric field will point towards the negative charge and will be along the line that connects the charge and the observation point. So I expect I expect that when I finish my calculations, I will find a vector that points downwards. Okay, that's what I expect for the field of this uh, charge. Just to put the other charge as well in there, it's at 3, 5, 6, so it's somewhere here, 3. And again, this is an approximate diagram, 5, 6, it's somewhere here. Uh, so that is uh, the 2E. And then that one will be pointing, let me just make sure that we don't fool ourselves that this will be collinear, they won't be collinear necessarily, 2E, and there will be a field that will be pointing now uh, away from this charge along the line that connects the charge and the P. So you see the electric field will be pointing away from the positive charge and will be pointing towards the negative charge. So let me just uh, put also, uh, sorry, the P is here, so that will be the first field. 
and the second field will be again pointing downwards like this okay so both fields I will do the math but I expect that both fields will be pointing downwards so now uh, for the formula I also need to calculate R minus R primed So I simply uh, subtract those two vectors, that will give me x plus 2y plus 2z. Now something that I noticed yesterday in, uh, my, uh, in uh, the Q&A after the lecture is that uh, uh, some people didn't notice the difference between the parentheses here, which means that this is a vector that shows the direction of the electric field, and this is a magnitude. These are uh, vertical brackets so that means now that I need to find also the length of this vector which physically is this distance between the charge and the observation point so I will do that so this uh, R minus R1 distance is basically 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 2 squared. So I take the uh, coordinates of uh, this and I add them up. So this is 4 plus 4 plus 1. It's 9 and then we have basically square root of 9 which is 3. So that is the distance. And now I'm ready to put everything together and find the electric field that is generated by the first charge. That will be you remember 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught is this constant 9 times uh, 10 to the 9th. So I put it here. Uh, then I have the electron charge Q1 <coughs> minus E divided by 3 to the power of 3 and then uh, that is uh, times this vector x plus 2y plus 2z So this is uh, the uh, final result for the field of the first charge. And you see that indeed it points downwards, as I would expect that it would. Uh, any questions up to this point? So you see you take it step by step and that is uh, always a good way to handle with uh, those formulas that can become very lengthy. But at the same time, if you break them down to those steps, the steps individually are uh, not uh, very difficult. So I will just repeat the same steps for the second charge. The second charge is at R2 prime. Uh, so the coordinates are 3, 5, 6. Uh, that means it's 3x plus 5y plus 6z. And now R minus R2 primed is equal to uh, 2 minus 3 is minus x hat, 3 minus 5 is minus 2 y hat, and then 4 minus 6 is minus 2 z hat. Uh, so then we have uh, a length of this vector, a magnitude. 1 plus 2 squared plus 2 squared, which is again uh, 3.
And uh, I will let me use this uh, part of the board just to conclude this small exercise, or actually I can do it here as well. Uh, so this uh, E of the <coughs> second uh, field is uh, the constant times the charge, which is now 2 times E, uh, 1.6 times 10 to minus 19 Coulomb, uh, divided by this distance cubed times the vector. So again, you see that it points downwards as we were expecting. And that is something I wanted really to emphasize that it is nice to have a physical feeling of what we're going to calculate. And uh, you see here comes in handy, I directly um, confirm that uh, this is the right uh, the right result. So finally we have um, uh, minus uh, 9 times, sorry, minus uh, 10 to the nine e x plus 2y plus 2z so you see here, indeed, as uh, my diagram uh, was tending to show me, these actual forces are uh, co-directional. They happen to be co-directional, so they will be like this. So when you add them up, uh, you find um, minus two-thirds, minus, uh, minus one-third, so it will be exactly uh, 10 to the ninth e x plus 2y plus 2z. So I can as well just write the final answer. So the key is that we apply this superposition principle. Everything happens to be linear. So the total field will be e1 plus e2. Uh, x hat plus 2y plus 2z. Okay, so this is the final result, 1.6 times 10 to minus 10, uh, pointing downwards. This is Newton per Coulomb. Let me just push the board up and uh, open the floor for any questions. Yes, please. So we'll be doing a lot of problems with electric fields. Like, so when we will understand, when we see a question, which formula to use this one? How do we uh, which other one? There is another formula. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I uh, really recommend that one. Because it, yes, because it's the easiest. You don't need to convert r minus r prime to a unit vector times its length. So, and there is no need to do the conversion. So, whenever position vector is concerned, we are going to use this formula. Yes, that is the easiest one. Uh, so, yesterday, I indeed derived a form of this formula with the unit vector in the direction that connects the charge and the observation point. I did that only to show you that indeed this formula, although it has a cube in the denominator, it is still an inverse square distance formula. So that was the only one. This one is the most convenient for calculations. I think he was first. Yeah, please go ahead. I was going to ask, let's say um, they weren't uh, in the same direction, or like, uh, like there was a difference in one of the components, uh, then what would we do? Nothing. I didn't. Uh, you, uh, so the question was, what would I do if the two fields were not in the same direction? I didn't invoke um, the direction of the two fields. I just added vectors. So indeed, this vector could have been 5x plus 2y plus 2z. I would add 5 with um, minus 1. 
So you just add the vectors. Yes? So just a general question. So at this question, we found both the direction and the magnitude of the electrical field. Right. So if, it, if the question is only asking for the magnitude, do we just ignore the vector part, or do, or do we find the magnitude from this? Um, so the question is, if, the question, if uh, this uh, problem was only about the magnitude of the electric field, would I still take vectors into account? Yes, you do, because if you add these two vectors, the, uh, the length of the sum of those vectors is not the sum of the lengths. Yeah. Only if they ha well, here they happen to be co-directional, so this holds, but in general it wouldn't. Uh, so you see these steps individually are not very difficult. So when you have in mind how this calculation is broken down into these small steps, I don't think that it becomes a difficult task. All right, um, so now I turn to a more interesting problem uh, that is uh, electric field from charge distributions. And again, I will um, turn to the applet for a moment. Uh, so I will present this topic through an example. And I will actually do three examples um, in my lectures on uh, how you calculate charge distributions. I think it's uh, better instead of uh, talking about this theoretically to just present the steps through examples. Uh, but uh, before I get to the example, which will be sort of a power line, that is the electric field of a long wire, let me just uh, show you how uh, this problem of charge distributions can be fundamentally different from just one single charge. Uh, so let's uh, put here one single charge. You see the field. Oops, you don't but you will see it now. Okay. So if I now start stacking, so you see the line, the, the field uh, vectors, right? They radially emanate from the point charge. So now if I start stacking charges along this line, I'm trying to reproduce here a a wire, a charged wire. See what happens. And of course, it's not perfect, but I'm uh, trying to do my best. OK. So you see, the electric fields now tend to become perpendicular to the wire. So you see that uh, by just adding more and more and more charges along a line, I'm engineering a totally different distribution of electric fields. And this is really what we are, uh, will be trying to do here to understand how this electric field changes from this radial pattern of the point charge to now an entire field distribution, uh, an entire charge distribution. So let me uh, take on this uh, particular problem. Uh, so this is my example. Uh, by the way, I hope that uh, the microphone works. Uh, can you hear me at the back? Yeah, okay, great. So here is the example. Uh, I will just put a power line on a, in a coordinate system. So let's, see that, let's say that we have along the z-axis a linear charge distribution. So I have what I called on Monday a Rosa Bell. Uh, 
line charge distribution in Coulomb per meter. And I'm being asked to find the electric field at a point here. Uh, and uh, for the point, I will define a distance from the z-axis. So you can uh, uh, just uh, imagine a distance d from the z-axis. Uh, so this uh, point has some uh, y-coordinate. Uh, the x-coordinate is 0. And there is some z coordinate here. Let me call it uh, L. Okay. So this is my observation point. So why can I not use this formula directly? So why is there a problem here? There's too many charges because this formula tells me something that seems very uninteresting. What is the electric field of a point charge? Whereas here, I have a charge distribution rho sub L. So let me just clarify here that I have a line charge density along the z axis. So that is uh, the, uh, the problem. So we don't have a point charge. We have many um, charges that are distributed along the axis. So here is how we solve these problems. The first step, so this is both a solution and a methodology. The first step is choose your coordinate system that you will work with. For example, if you look at Coulomb's law, that invokes this coordinate capital R. Capital R is the radial coordinate in the spherical coordinate system. So of course you can, in the example, I used this law in Cartesian coordinates, but if you look at it right away, take its face, face value, it actually invokes spherical coordinates. Why? Because the point is a spherically symmetric system. If you change, if you imagine that you are on a sphere around that centered at the point and you walk on the sphere, you don't see any difference in the structure of that point. The point just looks the same to you. The only thing that matters is what is your distance from that point. Such a system is, to, is called spherically symmetric. Now we have this wire. along the z-axis. So now, if you imagine that you are on a circle, so this is the xyz plane, Imagine you're drawing a circle on the xy plane and you start walking on this circle
and you are looking at that cylinder. Do you see any difference in that cylinder? No. Essentially, what you are doing now is you are changing your phi coordinate. So the phi coordinate, and I know that there is this discrepancy with the, uh, your math course, but the phi coordinate, and I will define it uh, uh, now, is, belongs to the cylindrical coordinate system. And uh, you see that if you keep changing that phi coordinate, you won't be seeing any difference in the source of the field. If you don't see any difference in the source, you shouldn't expect any difference in the effect. So this is a cylindrically symmetric system, just like a cylinder would be. Uh, here we have an infinitely thin wire. Uh, and therefore, it makes sense to actually use the cylindrical coordinate system for this one. So here we have this cylindrical symmetry What other symmetry can you observe in this wire that we consider to be infinite? And by the way, engineering-wise, what does it mean that the wire is infinite? It means that you are very far from the edges of the wire. So you see a power line that goes all the way from um, uh, the power station on uh, on uh, on Yang and Finch, uh, maybe somewhere in that area, and uh, it goes all the way to downtown. Okay, but you are at a school and you want to calculate whether the exposure to uh, kids that are playing uh, outside the school meets the safety limits. Okay, so you are very far away from the edges. So for you as an observer, the line looks infinite. So the calculation that we do really means, engineering-wise, that we're very far from the edges of this uh, charge system. And we're interested in calculating the field. So what other symmetry do you see here in this problem? In this infinite wire. When the theta changes, you do see a change. Because you see, if you are here, you see the wire. And if you change your theta angle, the theta def is defined for us from the uh, z-axis. Then obviously you're going away from the wire. Then you come closer to the wire. So no, when theta changes, you do see a change. Yes? So maybe along the z-axis? That's right, uh, uh, along the z-axis. Uh, it looks like... Uh, some sections of the 401, you keep going and you don't notice any change. So you see, if you change your Z coordinate, you won't actually see, you don't see any change in the system. So therefore, this problem knocks out two of the three coordinates of the cylindrical coordinate system. And that's why it actually makes sense to use the, this inspection of the problem shows that the easiest coordinate system to work with is actually the cylindrical coordinate system. So I'm picking the cylindrical coordinates. Other examples where cylindrical coordinate system would make sense. If I had, uh, let's say, a surface charge distribution on a cylinder, an infinite 
cylinder as well. Or if I was interested to calculate fields in uh, a type of structure that probably you have seen quite a bit, the coaxial cable. Uh, still, uh, we have coaxial cables at homes for TV. So that is the coaxial cable, two cylinders. And it uh, makes sense in retrospect that when you, I have cylinders involved or straight wires involved, uh, I, I should use the cylindrical coordinate system. So as a reminder, the cylindrical coordinate system takes the Cartesian coordinates of a point keeps from the Cartesian coordinates one of them namely it keeps the Z coordinate And then for x and y, it does the following, projects the point on the xy plane, you get this p primed. So this is actually the y and the x. But it's, instead of using the x and the y, it uses this distance of the projection from the origin on the xy plane. That distance we call r. You may see it as rho as well in uh, your book, uh, you call it r, and then defines also this angle phi. So uh, you can immediately see that r is square root of x squared plus y squared, and phi is the inverse tangent of y over x. So that is the conversion from the cylindrical to the Cartesian coordinates. And each vector has its corresponding unit vector. So the unit vector for R is a vector that points like this. I will call it R hat. The unit vector for Y points like this. So, sorry, for phi points like this. And I will call it phi hat. And then the z hat is the same. So r hat, you can extract it from the geometry, is x hat cosine phi plus y hat sine phi. And here is something I want you to remember. Many times, unconsciously, you make the correlation that a unit vector is a fixed vector in space. That's not true. That only holds for the Cartesian unit vectors, x, y, and z. A unit vector, like this r hat unit vector, the, has basically three requirements. Oops. Requirement one is obvious. Length has to be 1, otherwise it wouldn't be a unit vector. And you see that the length of this is actually 1. It's uh, uh, square root of cosine squared phi plus sine squared phi. The second requirement is that it has to be perpendicular to the locus of points where the corresponding coordinate is constant. So that
Okay? So how does this work for the R unit vector? If you fix R, so let me just uh, expand a little bit this diagram. If you fix R, if you say R is 2, what do you define? What shape do you define? A circle on the plane, but then if you, if you slide this circle along the z-axis, a cylinder. You define a cylinder. So actually this is the locus of points where R is fixed, R0, let's say. So this unit vector will have to be at each point perpendicular to this cylinder. So that means that it has to rotate with angle. And the third requirement, uh, so just to uh, show this projection, to project this on the xy plane, so that you see it a little bit more clearly, the projection of the cylinder on the xy plane is this, and you can easily see that at phi equals zero, for example, this vector is here along the x-axis. Along the y-axis at phi equal 90 degrees, it is along the vector points in the y-axis, and so on and so forth. So it's definitely not a fixed vector in space. What does that mean? It means that if you see it inside an integral, you have to integrate it. It's, you don't take it out of the integral. That is the uh, subtle point there. And the third is that it points in the direction of increasing, that this coordinate is uh, increasing. You can uh, check that these three rules are trivially satisfied by the Cartesian vectors. But uh, I just emphasize them because they, it seems that they are not uh, that intuitive when, the, when we're dealing with non-Cartesian vectors. And likewise, you see that the phi unit vector, the phi hat, will be pointing in this direction. Why? Because fixing phi defines a plane like this. In fact, this plane. Okay. So the phi hat will be pointing into the board, perpendicular to the plane, in the direction that the phi coordinate increases. So this was uh, the um, small uh, review of uh, the cylindrical coordinate system, and I will give you more information as needed, as needed. So I don't uh, like the approach where you spend three weeks uh, reviewing things and then, um, and, and then, uh, not covering the physics. So I want to get to the physics as soon as possible. Any questions? Yes. Can you go through the number two point again perpendicular to the of one point? Yes. So uh, I can repeat it for the phi angle so that I go through the point and I do something new. Uh, so for example, when I want to find, so rule number two for phi hat. Okay. So here is a question I ask myself, what is the shape that I define by saying phi is fixed? Okay. So the shape that I define is a plane because if you look what phi is, phi is this angle here. Okay. If you fix the angle, all the points that are along this plane will actually have the same phi. All the points that are along this plane, and this is an infinite plane, all these points have the same phi angle. Right? So I define this plane, and 
that means that the phi unit vector will have to point perpendicular to that plane, the phi hat unit vector. So uh, you can work out the equations. It turns out to be minus x hat sine phi plus y cosine phi. And points in the direction that the coordinate increases, the phi coordinate increases. Again, this is trivial. Let's say, how do these rules apply for the x unit vector? If you fix x, what do you define? x equals x naught. What is that? That is a yz plane, right? A plane like this, where the x hat unit vector has to be perpendicular to the plane. Yes, it is. It is on the x axis. It has to point in the direction the coordinate increases. Yes, it does, because it points towards the positive and not the negative x axis. So you see how these rules work. Okay. All right. So I will just get to the Second step, and then I will continue all the way to the solution on Monday. So that's the second step is visualize a distribution or analyze a distribution in point charges. How do I do this? Well, if you go back to our notes on Monday, you will see how we defined rho sub L. I have it up there actually as well. Rho sub L is dq over dz. And any charge distribution would have uh, some expression. If it is a surface charge density, dq over ds, if it is a volume charge density, dq over dv. So the charge that I'm, the point charge I'm looking for is up there. It's the dq. So from rho l equals dq over dz, dq is rho l z. Rho L, uh, rho sub L uh, times dz. So what, is, what does that mean? It means that as I have this uh, charge density along the z-axis, I can imagine that it consists of point charges like this one. You remember in Coulomb's law, we actually used prime coordinates for the charges and unprimed for the observation points. We need that bookkeeping. We need that bookkeeping because superposition means that you are superimposing your sources. But the observer is not superimposed. The observer stays fixed. So what we need to do here is find, analyze this distribution into point charges, find the field that each point charge creates via this formula, and then add them all up. So we need to separate the coordinates of the sources and the coordinates of the observer because the coordinates of the source, sources will be superimposed, whereas the observer stays the same. In this school example, the observer is still the kid that is playing and what I need to do is add up the fields from each charge on the wire. So this is my dq then. It is somewhere on the axis. And because I will assign prime coordinates, I will call it here rho L dz primed. So this dq is at 0, 0, z primed. So now you see I have found the charge, I have found the coordinates, and basically, I'm ready to apply this law to find the field 
that this guy will create at the observation point and then uh, do the last step, which is a superposition. So I will stop here, uh, work it out uh, to the end, and then on Monday I will uh, myself uh, finish it, and then we'll do some more examples so that uh, we learn this method uh, a little bit uh, better. So thanks for your attention. See you on Monday.